It's great to be here at the Witty on this Saturday morning as we're going to talk about San Antonio's fantastic, rich history. Uh, so much of it, frequently, uh, big chunks of it get left out. Uh, but we have folks like Bruce Shackelford who makes sure that uh, we remember uh, the high points and also the incredible uh, details. Uh, a lot of people, when we talk about the cattle drives of, uh, of the old days, the Westerns, uh, they think that it was the cowboys that did the driving, but actually it was economic forces. It was uh, economics, it was capitalism that made these cattle drives uh, such a tremendous success and brought wealth to Texas, brought wealth to San Antonio, and created uh, an economy that continues to flourish even today. And we're gonna be talking about that. What, uh, how did this system evolve? Who were the people behind it? How did, what were the innovations that made uh, Texas cattle country and also uh, a place where people who worked hard could uh, find fame and fortune? Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Bruce Shackelford, in case you don't know. He's a nationally recognized authority on the history of the American West. He's the curator of the South Texas Heritage Center and the George West Trail Drivers Gallery at the Witte Museum. He has created exhibits on the subject of uh, American Indian culture, the history of horsemanship, and the cattle industry in North America. He also lectures on related topics. He's written numerous articles, authored chapters and books like on the Black Cowboys of Texas and Texas Women of the Cattle Trails. And he is a frequently an expert featured on the PBS program Antique Roadshow. He is a favorite where he is known as their official cowboy scholar. Uh, Shackelford's education includes a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from uh, UT Austin, uh, where they have cattle somehow invoked into their football team. I don't know how they do that. And, and he also a Master of Fine Arts degree from the University of Oklahoma, Norman, and he's a practicer of traditional Mexican horsemanship. So he's also a chato. So let me introduce to you uh, this um, Bruce Shackelford. Thanks, David, and, and thank the Witty for doing this. It's a really good event, and I couldn't get on a horse now if I had to. Uh, it's, been a, it's been, I don't know, 10, 15 years. Uh, San Antonio, when we talk about South Texas especially, we think of cattle. We think of an endeavor. It's completely identified with the cowboy. The cowboy comes out of South Texas. This is highly argued, and Andres Tiarina and I have sat down, and I wrote a somewhat, it wasn't scathing, but it was an unpleasant article about a book that came out because they talked about all the Eastern attributions. Nobody in Europe, only on the Iberian Peninsula, did people practice wide, open-range cattle raising. That's the only place. It didn't come from England. It didn't come from France. It didn't come from anywhere else. It came from Spain. And why people keep trying to figure it in that, no, in Virginia, they were doing open range cattle. No, they were walking cows to market with a stick. <laughs> and when they, got, when they got cattle that were recalcitrant, which I believe were Bakewell Longhorns, what did they do? They shipped them to Texas with a couple of guys coming to Austin's colony. And those are the first really huge longhorn typey cattle we see because longhorns are not a breed, they're a type. Um, so my, my opinion is it started here. This is where it happened and it happened from the beginning. And that's the animals we're talking about. Some were larger, some were smaller. I can take you to see that steer right now. He does not have nine foot wide horns. They're more like in the neighborhood of five. Uh, but he was a nice long horn and he was well thought of and he still exists, or his skeleton does. This is what we're talking about. We're talking about hard scrabble ranchers that are trying to raise cattle in whatever situation they can get through. Texas was a pretty good place. It was better than Spain, or a lot of the places in Spain. And you had the tradition of the, cow the, tradition of the cowboy, the mission vaqueros that had been taught all these skills, that learned how to do this, they passed it on. 
This is a very important document that's in the General Land Office. Why is it in the General Land Office? Because it's the Bejareños that ranched all over this area saying, hey, what's the deal? Why are you guys not doing what you said you were? 1778, if you look up here, you'll see very important names like Menchaca and all the local ranchers signed this and filed it. Well, it tells us two things. One, they had a connection with the government as best they could. And number two, they could read and write. And that wasn't necessarily that common. So these, these people had a plan and they carried forward with it and they started it early. Uh, there were early drives to the American Revolution. There were drives before that. What we all forget is Galvez. Bernardo Galvez, he was the governor of Louisiana. And when he was the governor of Louisiana, he made a deal with George Washington. They all had a mutual enemy. That always makes friends, too. The British. So we've got, not only got to feed these guys, we've got to have fighters. They're fighting in, uh, in Louisiana. They're fighting in Florida. And uh, a herd goes out of San Antonio. And they're going through uh, a, one big herd of 2,000 goes through La Bahia uh, to Louisiana and then See if I can find it written down here. Francisco Garcia in uh, 1779 uh, takes 2,000 head from San Antonio. Not from around San Antonio, from San Antonio. So there were already lots of cattle here. Uh, ranching was an endeavor from the beginning and, uh, and it was an important endeavor and all the skills that went with it. Now we all remember the gear, the hats, the boots, the you know, all the stuff. But what you've got to remember is the goal of this was to provide food for people. It's about beef and it's about moving beef. And the easiest way to get cattle somewhere in this period was to walk them. I mean, how else are you gonna get them there? You can't load them in carts. I mean, what a nightmare. And, uh, and as, as travel changed, as, as modes changed, so did the way they got them there. This is a Texas cowboy, Texas rancher uh, that was depicted in 1827 by John Louis Berlandier. This watercolor's in the Gilcrease archives. And during this time, you had people it had huge plots of land. And one person I specifically want to bring out because she was really involved in this east-west situation is Doña Maria del Carmen Calvillo Delgado. And now she's pretty well just goes by Maria Calvillo. And she was the daughter of Francisco Calvillo. And he was a presidial soldier and was stationed at a mission Espada. And he bought Rancho de las Cabras, which was the mission of Spotter Ranch over there by Floresville after secularization. Okay, he gets murdered by his nephew. Oh well, the guy across the river is Gavino Delgado. And Delgado was another Spaniard and he was a rancher. He also took the, the Republican side in the Medina battle. So all of a sudden, at the battle, after the Battle of Medina, Gavino Delgado, or during it, he disappears and pops up in New Orleans and never comes back. So she, she lists herself as unmarried in census rolls after 10 years. She's done with him. She goes back to Calvillo. She was also driving cattle to New Orleans and to Louisiana. And you get an 1837 map of Bear County of this area and you look at all the property from Mission is spotted of, to what's now Floresville, you won't believe how many of those tracts of land are hers. She, she continued to expand the operation and to grow. This is, this is giving her a tract of land that she applied for. And that's also in the state archives. And what's that, 1832? And, and she was awarded that tract. This is the tract that's down by Floresville, which is Rancho de las Cabras. She had firm title on all of this. She was good with paperwork and she made sure she kept her law, legal business in order. And that's still now a national park. Back. 
These are vaqueros in 1859 outside of San Antonio. This is Frank Leslie's Illustrated News. And for all those people who think that woolly chaps were only worn on the northern plains, they came from here. In the earliest photograph we have of a man in woolly chaps, which are Angora, or it was taken um, by Louis de Planck at Corpus Christi. And, and this guy obviously has these Angora chaps on each side of that saddle guarding his legs. They would have called them Armas then. And, uh, you know, these guys had an identity, a real specific identity. They dealt with huge animals. You know, there's a lot of fun and excitement in it. It's really hard work but it's a choice. But as I said, they're driving cattle back and forth to Louisiana on a regular basis. Uh, between 1800 and 1860s, tens of thousands of cattle went into Louisiana and they crossed at Beaumont, which it became a huge problem of cattle drowning. And you also had future San Antonians, uh, Meyer and Solomon Howe, and they were in Liberty, Texas in the 1850s. These gentlemen were Jewish merchants. Uh, Meyer came first. He was with his big brother. His big brother dies. Little brother comes in, Solomon. And they create this mercantile. And, and they find out a lot of the people they're supplying in Liberty are going east. And they're going east with cattle herds and they're resupplying going into Louisiana. And so that they see that this is a big part of their business. They also see that these guys don't have money till they come back. So they start fronting operations. Within a year or so, they're not only fronting operations, they are the investors putting together the deals. When we think of cattle herds, we think of Richard King gets together all the cattle on his ranch and drives them north. No. What it is, it's small ranchers and small farmers that say, you know, we got five extra cows this year, we need to get rid of them. And so they consign five with the drover. This guy consigns 100, this guy consigns two. When you get about 1,200 together, the drovers say, ah, let's go. And they take them and they sell them and then they divvy it up at the end. And as times changed, especially up towards the Civil War, People didn't do just cut and dried deals. And that began to change also. And remember, people down here, they like to eat beef. They don't just eat pork. They don't just eat mutton. They don't eat lamb. They, they like beef. Well, in the Northeast, that wasn't so much. The preferred food in Kentucky and Tennessee and Virginia, you know those Virginia hams? They liked pork. And, and that was the primary meat, meat source. So what happens? This starts the story. And what's going on is these guys, they come up here. You go through here and you cross here or you cross here. And you see this, this, okay, see right there? River of Texas. We don't, we don't think of that. We don't think the Red River of Texas goes to the Mississippi River. It goes through Natchitoches. It goes by Alexandria. <coughs> In the early 1800s, you've already got shipping traffic. The main problem is log jams, but you've already got people, and they're hauling to here, and they're loading up at a place that became known as Red River Station. I found one photograph of Red River Station and I've never been able to find it again after I found it, but all it was was about four buildings and acres of barrels and packing crates and things stacked up to be loaded on steamboats to go up the Mississippi. And so this was a major supply point going both north and south. And this is an Austin map and these guys, that's where they were headed. and. Uh, and here's where it changes. Uh, the guy who's listed here is uh, a gentleman that I won't go, it, it's Solomon Cunningham, who was not a well-liked guy. He, he became somewhat notorious in Victoria. But Cunningham comes in, 
and he buys a shipping operation. And this is in the Victoria Advocate, and I believe this is 49, 1850. In the article, it says that they will continue the shipping they've been doing for two years between Indianola, which we all forget about because it blew away, and New Orleans. And they're shipping 45 to 55 head of cattle twice a week from Indianola to, to New Orleans. Well, that doesn't sound like a whole lot, but over a year it starts adding up. These are live animals. We get another mention that I've found in two completely separated sources. And when I say separated, one's Texas and one's California. Till I found the California reference, we all thought it was a lie, that it was this fantasy. And then I found a third reference from Joseph McCoy, who set up Abilene, Kansas. And a guy that worked with the West Brothers named McCutcheon, he was a hero of the Texas Revolution, came in, raised cattle over there by um, uh, Austin, and had a big herd, ended up moving down to Lavaca County. McCutcheon wrote that he, that he shipped 10,000 cattle to Illinois up the Mississippi. I mean... First of all, what a god-awful mess to have 10,000 head of cattle on barges. I mean, I, I, can't, I know why they walked them. I mean, I can't think of anything worse. You've got to feed cattle. You've got to water cattle. You can't just go. And, and, but this shows that this traffic started early. And, and it was going on as well as the cattle drives. And New Orleans was the point, And it spread out from there. Uh, King Ranch was founded in 1852, and so they start adding to the mix, and they're already on the coast. I found records that in 1855, the so-called Opelousas Trail, which is the trail that goes literally from here to Beaumont and into Louisiana, and then you either turn north and went to, to Nacogdoches, I mean Nacogdoches, or went to uh, Alexandria, or else you went to New Orleans, they carried 50,000 cattle annually and 5,000 a year by boat. So there's, there's 55,000 head a year going back and forth, and that's 1850. I mean, that's the end of the Mexican, U.S.-Mexican War. And that, we all think of this not happening until after the, the Civil War. Then things change again. Reconstruction in the Civil War. Most of the South is dead broke. States declare bankruptcy. Texas is going, no. We're not, we think of ourselves as the Deep South. We're not the Deep South. We're, we're peripheral to a lot of that. We were peripheral to the war. Uh, we sent people to it. They're fighting in Tennessee. They're going from San Antonio and Bear County to Tennessee to fight. They're not fighting in San Antonio. You know, there's guys here in town making money, making uniforms, saddles. There's guys on the coast making guns. Uh, you know, we're getting, we're getting the good end of this deal. And we say, hey, you know, these guys come home. We found letters between two brothers that were part of the West family from Virginia. And they're saying, take care of our cows. You know, mark the cows, brand them, do the earlops, because we're going to come back. Well, he, de he didn't come back. He was killed in uh, Louisiana at the Battle of Monnets Ferry, but the, you get a price jump. A $3 a head cow in San Antonio or a steer is 20 to $30 in, in New Orleans, and that's from the U.S. Army. This is guaranteed money. This is a contract. It says, we'll buy this, we want these, we want this many, and here's what we're willing to pay for them. Charles Goodnight, the same deal. He's fulfilling U.S. government contracts. This is a good deal. This is a good deal. You go to your neighbors, you say, hey, here's what we're going to do. The neighbor says, okay, well, I want it in gold or I want it in silver or I'll take it on the arm or, you know, you have to pay me in advance. But these guys are able to get these herds together and go up the trail. The center of all this is San Antonio. The second center of it becomes Fort Worth because it's on the trail or close to the trail. And it becomes a huge, huge endeavor. 1866, 260,000 cattle driven up the trail. 
260,000 in a year. Now, what had happened is they opened up Abilene, Kansas. Joe McCoy opened it up. He advertises all over the Victoria Advocate, the San Antonio newspapers, and says, bring your cows to me, boys. We're going to make it happen. The first herd that goes out of Abilene, that goes to Abilene, Kansas, goes out of San Antonio. And again, this shows Louisiana where the Red River goes down into the Mississippi, and there was a jump off where you could cut across. And just to show you, that's a steamboat called the Red River because it was working between Natchitoches and, and between uh, the station there, Red River Station on the Mississippi. There's another one. This is the Red River of Texas. This is not the Mississippi. This is, this is the Red River. And that's what happened. You had a log jam that went from Natchitoches 30 miles out. And clear up into the early 20th century, the U.S. government was trying to blow it up and spent a lot of money on it. And that's where you get the trail drives. And Wheeler left San Antonio, O.W. Wheeler, 1867, 2,400 steers up the Chisholm Trail to Kansas. He was the first herd to leave. And in 1867, 35,000 head of cattle went, to the, went up the Chisholm Trail to Abilene only. And there were other cattle that went up the trail, like I said. And uh, nobody expected the boom to happen like it happened. They, they knew it was going to be a big deal, but they didn't know how big a deal it was. And you can see this is a herd going by a little small town in North Texas. And, you know, that's what these guys were dealing with. They were looking out their back window and seeing 2,400 cattle out their back window and going, oh, great. Sometimes they were happy and sometimes they were going, oh, no. And uh, the gist of it is, is between 1866 and 1886, 20 million, 20 million cattle were herded from Texas north on the trail in over a million head of horses. And we forget the horses, but a million. Uh, Drover Saunders, George W. Saunders, who started the San Antonio, well, he bought the San Antonio Stockyards and took it over and was very important in Fort Worth. Saunders estimated that 35,000 Texas cowboys went up the trail. So quite a few. And they were black, they were white, they were brown, they were whoever they could get on that trail. They were guys who knew how to manage animals, they knew how to cook, they had bosses, and and the deals weren't done unless they were going to lose money. The drovers who were professionals, they knew what was going all the time. They kept offices in San Antonio and Austin. They petitioned Congress. They sent telegrams to Kansas City and to Abilene and to Dodge City, and they knew who was buying and what they were paying. They knew the contracts. If they could get a contract in advance, they let those contracts and fulfilled them. If they couldn't, they're making deals while that herd's en route. You're talking two to three months to get up the trail if everything goes well. You're hoping your neighbor's son doesn't get killed and you have to go explain that to somebody. Uh, you know, so you've got a guy on the ground in San Antonio managing all this, making sure that supplies are had. You've got supply stops around the, along the way. If you get there a little early in the, in the Flint Hills up in Osage country in northern Oklahoma, you can pay the Osage if you have that relationship to graze your cattle, fatten them up, and then take them up into Ellsworth or drop them over into Abilene or Dodge City. Now that was basically the end of the trail, and that's where animals start getting shipped out, and, and they're mainly headed towards Chicago. And this communication was a big part of it. And, and when I say drovers, these are the guys that became multi-multi-millionaires in Texas. And, um, And I'm going to skip that, but, but again, this was the largest movement of domestic animals in the history of the world. Now, wild animals, no. You've got bats, you've got wildebeest, but the largest movement of a domestic animals, this is it. This was Texas going up the trail. These are the trails. This is an official trail, trail map put out by the railroad telling you how to get there. Now, what goes with this is a little pamphlet, and it, and it 
identifies where you're headed, what you're looking for, you know, the towns, what's available. You know, at Ellsworth, there's a good supply operation. You know, you go into Fort Worth and party, you know, at the two mini saloon. There's, there's different things that are listed on how you get there. But this is basically the trip we're talking about. Now, Texas fever, as it became a problem, they, they just moved west and went around it. I mean, you know, what the deal? Saw a few cattle die, who cares? You know, I mean, this was a huge financial enterprise. And it was a lot easier to pay for a farmer's lost cattle than it was to stop a herd of 2,500 going up the trail. There was a lot of early work that had to be done. They had to be road branded. They had to be gathered first and put in one place to go up the trail. So you've got to have a ranch, and it doesn't have to be big. A lot of ranchers worked off two or 300 acres. But they gathered those cattle. There were pens in Atascosa County. There were pens in deep South Texas where they could gather cattle out of Mexico and out of South Texas, put together these herds, road brand them, get them ready to go. This is the guy. Hardly anybody's heard of this guy. He was a, a freighter during the Civil War. And we're not real sure. We know he was supplying the Confederacy, but apparently he was never an official military man. He, he was just a freighter. And at one time in one summer between, or spring and summer, between San Antonio, Texas, and Kansas, he had 42,000 head of cattle strung out on the trail. And he's the all-time record holder that anybody knows about. And this, is, this information is from people who were living there, doing it at the time. This is not looking back. This is everybody who knows who was involved with this. Fant was the guy. And he taught the West Brothers. He taught Henry Shiner. He taught all these guys how to do this. They were kids. And he comes back from the Civil War to Victoria and says, well, boys, we can make money, and here's how we're going to do it. He also knew the trails because he'd been a freighter during the Civil War, and he built a little house in San Antonio called Via Finale down there in King William. That was a drover's cottage, guys. And that's Fant when he was in the Trail Drivers Association. And uh, he could read, he could write. We have letters in the West collection that he did. These are some of the West Cowboys. I mean, you know, these, these are neighbors. And if you're 35 years old, you're not going to go up the trail. You've been there, you've done that, and you're through. You're not going to do that again. It's a mess. Here's the three West brothers. The reason I always include those, and because I wrote a book about them, and they're very important. But there was about 20 drovers who were professional drovers they were not into building this world of big ranches at this time because the money to be made was driving cattle. These were Lavaca County boys. They made more money driving cattle than anybody in that area. They also worked with the Bennetts, the Shiners. They worked with Fant. They worked with all the big names. They all had houses here in San Antonio. At least the, the two younger brothers, Ike and Saul, they had houses in San Antonio by the early 1880s. And, and expanded their ranching operations. Their big brother stayed on the ranch most of the time. But these are the guys who were telling people what to do on the end of the trail. This wasn't a, let's go hoop it up, get our cattle up the trail, meet the Indians and come back. This, this was something you did on a regular basis. It was highly planned, expenses were planned, and George West went on a herd trip with his neighbor, and when he got home at the end of the year, the neighbor owed him $300. Well, $300 then was about like 300000 now. So you got a 17-year-old kid that can go out and buy a ranch and a house. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking tremendous amounts of money. And it's flowing through San Antonio. This is right outside of San Antonio. This is a cowboy, probably late 1880s. This is from the uh, Julian Onderdonk photo collection. And like I say, there was a lot to do. Every cowboy rode half a dozen horses every couple of days. This was not a, you get on old paint and ride up the trail. You get on old paint, and then you get on Susie, and then you get on Bill, and then you get on George, and you ride them up the trail. And Longhorns, again, dominated the South Texas scene clear up to the late 1800s. It was a, it was a multicultural task. It wasn't who you were. It was if you could do the job and were reliable. 
This is another South Texas cowboy from down towards Corpus Christi. This is the Rock Ranch. And all these guys were coming through here. Then everybody talks about the railroad. The railroad was not a deal. The railroad was a deal for the railroads, but it was not a deal for the ranchers. You see those horns? They're trying to load that car. It is not an easy project. It's difficult, it's a hassle. You have to stop and feed these cattle every day. You have to water them, feed them, walk them around, or they die. And ever so often the railroad, they'd say, let's pull this, si this car up on this siding. And they had to build pens. They had to build pens and water tanks. So you've got this string of wells across the country, and you've also got pens. And the pens were specified by the railroads. You had to have them this size, they had to do this and this, they had to have ramps, and, and we have a set of the plans that show that. And these guys had to unload these cattle. Well, sometimes if the cowboys weren't there waiting, who had been contracted to take care of this, or if they weren't on the train, the, the train would say, okay, let's leave these cars on this siding and the next, the next engine passing by will hook them up and take them the rest of the way. And three days later, they pull up, and they got cars full of dead cows. That happened more than once. Then they came up with reefer cars. At this point, you've got guys like Swift and Armour involved, and I'm sure you've heard those names. And Swift and Armour are packers, and that's what ultimately all of this is about. And, uh, and it becomes huge. These cars are refrigerated with ice and salt. And they realized that the whole problem is, is when you're trying to sell beef and you're shipping a whole animal, you're having to pay for hides, you're having to pay for horns, you're having to pay for hooves, bones. If you're a beef packer, you just want the beef. You can do the hides somewhere else. You can do the hides in Kansas, but the, closest, the closer you can get that animal to where it's gonna be, be slaughtered, the more money you're gonna make. And so, they came up with these reefer cars and started packing and refrigerating beef. And it was better if they could do it. If you got there late in the season, they would put the beef out and wait for winter and ship the beef during winter because it stayed cold anyway. This was the first refrigerated clipper ship. A couple of Scotsmen get together and say, hey, we need to ship this stuff frozen. We can make some real money. We've got a place called Ireland. We've got Australia. So all of a sudden, you've got guys with big plans. And, the, and all the guys in Scotland, in Ireland, in England, they say, you know, we can make a lot of money off this. Let's, uh, let's start ranches. Let's do it from, from ranch to table. The first, well, I'll go back on this. And, uh, you know, you got George Hammond and Gustavus Swift. They, they move closer to the railheads to lower it. And, you know, the solution to this whole problem was refrigeration and cold weather cars. They started insulating cars. On these ships, what they would do, they would alternate the sides of beef with ice and salt. And they heavily insulated the walls of the ships. And then they overlaid them with blankets and insulation. And they could actually get to Ireland, especially Dublin, which was on the other side. They could get them there frozen and then distribute them. And so it, it became a big deal. And you had, I mean, the money involved. You got all these guys in, in Wyoming, in Montana, in the Texans. Th this was considered the breeding ground of stock for all that country. The West made hundreds of thousands of dollars selling these guys breeding stock. And you had, you had the Frewin brothers, you know, Granville Stewart, Teschmacher and Ulrichs, they were Harvard boys that went out there and a lot of these guys were for, from Harvard and Yale. The Marquis de Moray from France and Theodore Roosevelt. And these guys went up, set these big ranches up and it was, they lost everything. The, Texas, the Texans skinned them. We didn't get that winter in 87 that killed 50% of all the animals on the range. We didn't go bankrupt with those British multinational corporations that set all this up. We walked away and said, thank you, you want any more? And, and that is basically what happened. As far as money involved, it was, 
it's just more than we can than we can imagine today and the figures I was trying to I'm trying to look up the specific figures but it was it was 30 meat in this country in 1880 was 30% of the gross national profit we're talking the equivalent of billions I mean it, it was huge and that's why the cattle industry happened. It happened to feed people. It hasn't slowed up that much. We're still a huge beef producing state. And as long as people are eating beef, we still will be. So thank you and any questions, I'll try to answer them. So you wanna go ahead? When they're taking these thousands of head of cattle up the trail, how far on either side of the trail did you have to go to find food so that they could eat? And what did the landowners think about these people driving their cows over their land and eating all their grass? Well, prior to fences, it wasn't a problem. The trails were about two miles wide. And, and if you fly over some of them, you can still see them today. Some of them are highways. Interstate 35 is basically the Chisholm Trail. Highway 87 is basically the Western Trail. Uh, and, and there are ranches you can fly over and see that. And, you know, it became a problem. The drovers that made money, Fant and the West Brothers drove herds up the trail headed west as late as 1889 and they were cutting fences and fixing them and you know but until 1885 when they literally closed the trail and put armed guards up there in northern Oklahoma and said you're not coming through here uh, they petitioned Congress Congress says we're gonna we're gonna go with you and start the Great Western Trail and do all this stuff and then they said that eh, changed our minds the railroad boys got to them and said we're not gonna do that and that was basically the end of the trail drives in any size was 85. And you also, you're getting all this refrigeration by then. And once that happens, you know, it's, it's not so much of an issue. And then you get local stockyards. Saunders, this, the guy from Goliad who ends up in San Antonio, Saunders, he knew how to move forward with it. He knew what was coming, he saw how changes were coming, and he bought the San Antonio Stockyards, the Union Stockyards operation, and he made millions in, in the early 20th century, and ultimately tens of millions. He didn't just make a lot of money. This, this was the way of the future, and he went with it. But I was looking, at 36, by 1880, 36 Brit British companies had invested $45 million into the U.S. cattle business. That's the equivalent of $1.1 billion today. And at the time, that single pool of investors was 30% of the U.S. gross domestic profit. Just in British investors. And they all went bust. So it was about a 30-year span that we had the era of the great trail drives. How did that become such a crystallized part of the American myth? These were country boys. They lived on the ranch, you know. They, they, they would get picked up in downtown San Antonio and they'd been painting houses. And all of a sudden, they're gonna go on the adventure of a lifetime. And people remembered it. They saw their friends die. It was, it was like going into combat for soldiers. But this was something that lasted for decades. It involved men, women. It, it was not a, a single endeavor by, by a single group of people. It was anybody who worked as a cowboy and they would hire a lot of people to eat dust all the way. And again, the drovers stayed home. I mean, why go up the trail when you can send your little brother? You know, and that's, there's people in this room know that story really well. And, and, and then you had people like Saunders who said, this is the greatest thing that's happened in my life. It's like, if you want to find out about the fur trade, you go to John Jacob Astor. He became, you know, one of the richest people in America at the time in the fur trade. And his memories of that era and what happened were huge. But the fact is, the cattleman made more money than he ever made, 
ever by multiples. So, other question? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Bruce, there's a uh, cattle drive episode that I think is totally neglected, and that is uh, after the Mexican War and, eight, uh, and after 1849 gold discovery in California, turns out there's a big cattle drive from San Antonio to California that goes down Highway 90. And there's a diary of a drover in 1852 or 3, and then Redding W. Black, who founded Uvalde, kept the diary right by Highway 90, and he mentions herds of four and 500 going by his store regularly. And I, uh, what's the price differential between a cow in San Antonio and one in California to get people to go all that way? A buck in <laughs> Texas, a buck to two bucks. And, and this is the way the Reynolds brothers got rich up in Shackleford County by Albany. They didn't, they didn't stop. They kept going. A lot of those guys were following the old Butterfield stage line, which became called the Goodnight Loving Trail. But before that ever happened, Reynolds gets together a herd of about 1,500 cattle, and he drives them into New Mexico, up into Colorado, spends the winter, and then hires a bunch of Mormon cowboys and he takes them over the Rockies and takes them to Sacramento, and he comes back two years later rich. Not, not well off, rich. His wife is wearing silk clothes, he's got engraved Colt pistols, and he has sold those cattle for about $27 a pop. And, and you know, basically he had expenses. He took his wife with him, she went in a wagon with him across the trail. Her sister went. You know, it was kind of a family endeavor, so they split it all up. But, but the, the price differential was huge. But you had to have those connections. You had to know, okay, when we get to this point, our cowboys go home and the Mormons take it over. And there were some major Mormon drovers that would take them over the mountains. And from here, they would take them up through the south. But then the cattle industry got big enough in Southern California and around that area between um, south of San Francisco, between LA and San Francisco, that they could pretty well supply it themselves. I mean, it was a matter of moving animals. And once they got a move, they were okay, you know. But anybody that's driven you know, to California by Highway 90 and going out that way, that's, all, that's a hard way to drive cattle. Yeah, know, it is. All across <laughs> New Mexico, Arizona, yeah. Death Valley, I mean, my gosh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that's why they remembered it, you know. I noticed in the beginning of the presentation there were the Longhorns. I guess the reputation that they had was that they gained weight along the trip. They would eat anything. they eat their way all the way up to wherever they're headed. But I noticed in your last... Uh, larger group of animals, they were white-faced Hereford. Yep. How much of a difference occurred because of transportation capability and how much did that actually shift the kind of cattle that were being moved? Because well, the, the, Hereford, the Hereford obviously aren't going to gain weight when they're uh, moving along. Well, it, it, it was a lot of it, but you had you had North Texas ranchers especially, not so much down here. You had South Texas ranchers mixing in Brahma blood, you know, uh, Boss Indicus blood early in the late 1870s. You had, in the late 1870s, the North Texas ranchers are breeding in Herefords, and they're getting royal stock from England. They're not just getting Herefords, they're getting the top of the line. And so it started pretty early, and some cattle that we identify as Herefords are just painy looking Jersey cows, because there weren't so many breeds back then. I mean, breeds were a mid-19th mid century thing. The only thing you could really trace as a breed were thoroughbreds because they had a closed stud book. And there weren't many animals that had closed stud books, but thoroughbreds to this day have a closed stud book. So you can trace them all. And that is a true breed. What we consider quarter horses, all that, we keep breed records, but they're typey horses. It's the same with cattle back then. Not all Longhorns had giant horns. Some of them did, some of them didn't. Not all of them had that paint hide on them. And you look at the Chicago Stockyards photographs of this time period, they're all different sizes. And somebody said, well, you can't prove that. Well, I had a set of Longhorns with a, 
label from the company in St. Louis that mounted them in 1878, and they said what they were, and that's about as close as I'm going to get other than a dated photograph, and they're not giant horns. They're, you know, they're hard to load, though. It's not fun. Try to work a longhorn in a chute and see how much fun that is. <laughs> uh, more to that point, can you talk more about the origin of a longhorn uh, and how those big herds were, were <laughs> developed? Well, in my thinking, that's a genetic discussion. I'm not a scientist. I think that Bakewell Longhorns probably figured into that because I know two Austin colonists brought major Bakewell herd sires that had been shipped into Virginia, and they found them too difficult to work on foot. They tended to attack the rancher or the farmer, and they didn't like them, but they brought them to Texas. So they were in Texas by the time of Austin's colony. You go back to records, Spanish records, you don't see mentions of long-horned cattle. You see mentions of cattle, you see mentions of black Spanish bulls, you see a lot of talk about, about stock, but you don't hear giant horn stories. Well, by the 1830s and 1840s, you're hearing, you know, this cow, this, this bull with giant horns attacked me, killed my horse, and I had to shoot him. You know, you're, you're hearing that kind of talk. And you don't find so much of that during the Spanish era. They definitely have Spanish blood. There's no question about that genetically, that they have a Spanish base. But how much of that is what and who's done the gene runs on all this, I don't know. And A&M has published a little bit about it, and I don't know whether they've done Bakewell's. Bakewell is the oldest stud book breed uh, of cattle in the world. They were, that, that, herd, that herd book was started, I think, in the 18, late 1830s. Uh, no, it would have been the 18, early 1820s that they started that stud book. Yeah? Um, yeah. In the last few years, and it's a combination of the, both the uh, cattle, Bos Indicus and Bos Taurus, and they probably came from Spain, they called them retintos in Spain, and then they came to Mexico. Yeah. But he has done the DNA on the Longhorn, yeah. being, a, being a Longhorn himself. Yeah, that's, that's where I would look. I'm not a scientist, you know, and, and that's, you're talking genetics, and, and you need to get the genetic runs, and they should have that. And, uh, and I think she's right, that's where I would look. Were there any scammers, people that were taking advantage of this and running cons? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were lots. But, it, it, you know, there was anybody who doesn't know business can lose money. And I'm, I know that a lot of people lost money, but that's the difference between a professional drover and a group of neighbors that gets together and goes north and sells their cattle for less money than they than they spent on them here, than, it, than the cost. And, you know, professional drovers already had a contract, got them up there and sold them. And, and that was the deal. And there were all kind of things. I mean, the stories abound of the trail. There's, you know, the, the cattle queen of Lavaca County who ended up marrying Dan Rice, the circus promoter and producer. You know, her husband goes up the trail with a herd of cattle and dies on the way. And his cowboys telegraph her and say, you know, your husband's dead. What do we do? And guess what? She wasn't under Spanish law over there. They were, they were saying, you don't, you don't have a right to these cattle till we clear the estate. So she goes to Kansas. She gets a judge to rule that she can sell the herd so they don't lose any more money. She sells the herd and gets the money. It's held up in estate. It, it plays out for several months. And she sticks with it. And by the end of about five years, she's rich. She's loaded. And, and is best friends with, with Mrs. West. <laughs> and, and because she lives up the road in Lavaca County. And these people are coming to San Antonio all the time. She met Dan Rice at a lecture. She met two husbands at a lecture. The one before Dan Rice who took her jewelry and ran off and then Dan Rice, and she, she was coming to hear a program like this, and, 
He said, oh, the cattle queen of Lavaca County, and I'm in the circus. And she ended up living in New Jersey. She lived out her life there. But there's just <laughs> stories abound like that. It's the same with the packing end of it. You know, I mean, they turned South Chicago into a pit. It was not a nice place to be. You know, you could smell it coming. I was uh -huh. going to ask, was there an economic uh, impact on the cities that were along the Mississippi that were no longer shipping cattle up the river once the railhead was established? Did some of those cities disappear, basically? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's no Red River Station. There's nothing there at all. Some of the ferries, long gone. The bridges are even gone. There's nothing there. And the same in Texas. I mean, you know, not so, not so much, but yeah. You had the uh, figures up there at one point about $3 a head to get the cattle in San Antonio. And right. Our army was offering. That was a government contract price. 20 to yeah. 30 bucks, yeah. Um, what it did, it sounds like a great profit, but on average, how much would they have had to spend getting the cattle to New Orleans? Well, to ship a, to ship a chuck wagon back from Louisiana cost about the same then as it does today. So it cost about 150 bucks to, to get a chuck wagon back. And, and you didn't want to, you know, you spent money on your wagon. And so you had two choices. You either left it or you drove it back, which was going to take just as long as it took to get there. Or you shipped it back on a train. A lot of people would ship into East Texas and then drive the last of the road back here. And so I can't tell you exactly what it cost to, a head to get them up there. But, you know, when you're talking about a profit margin of, of 15 to 20 times cost, you know, and, and cowboys worked fairly cheap. I mean, these guys are, you know, they're not in a cut on the deal. They're hired. And, and a good drover, he doesn't want to just hire the neighbor's son who's never been around cattle. He wants a professional cowboy. And these guys liked the life, and they did it. And, you know, and it did cost a lot, but the profit margin was huge. I mean, we're we're out of time. We've got one last quick, okay. quick question. Um, we got to wrap up. All right. Where did these uh, cattle originate from? I mean, to have to gather all these thousands of cattle in San Antonio and then drive them up to, you know, where they come from, like South Texas, Mexico? Both. Both, okay. All over. From, from East Texas, the first big herds are in East Texas by the early 1800s. 1820, Taylor White's got a huge herd, two or 3,000. And it, they came out of Mexico, where they were driven into South Texas. Anywhere there was cattle that they could drive in here and then drive up the road and sell them. All right, a big round of applause for Bruce Shackelford, South Texas Thank you Heritage Curator Expert.